Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session on uh, emergent views of the Earth's interior. Um, this session, as you see, was organized by seismologists, computational and, and experimental mineral physicists and, ge and a geodynamicist. It was really inspired by the increased synergy between these three fields, um, which is producing uh, a, a convergent type of science where these three fields contribute together to solve a single problem. Um, seismology has contributed new images of the Earth's interior, clear plumes coming from the core mantle boundary, new 3D map, density maps. Mineral physics has contributed uh, new phases, discoveries of the experimental and uh, uh, computationally. Um, some phases, hydros phases existing stable up to the core mantle boundary, and new iron bearing phases. This is a great deal of novelty. And uh, geodynamics is incorporating now um, mineral physics proper, thermodynamics properties, densities, um, book modulus, pressure temperature dependent properties in their simulations. So this session is going to illustrate the integration of these fields, uh, what is emerging from each one of them, and new, Im new uh, views of the Earth's interior. So welcome to our session. And Kei Rose is going to chair the session. Thank you. All right. Um, good morning. So the first speaker of the session is uh, Jessica Abi. The, she's talking about emerging views of Earth's core and E' prime layer at the top of the outer core. Good morning, everyone. In this 14-minute slot, I'm going to try and spend about 12 minutes telling you some of the exciting things that we think might be happening at the top of the outer core and maybe even at the bottom of the mantle from a seismological perspective, but thinking about their geodynamic and mineral physics implications as well. So why should you care? You clearly care you're in the room. But the outer core is really important. It's important for generating Earth's magnetic field. The geodynamo operates there. It's also an important heat source for the mantle. It's having some heat extracted to power mantle convection and ultimately plate tectonics. There have been recent suggestions of some stratification in the outer core, especially at the top of the outer core and also at the bottom of the outer core. And some of the questions we might want to ask are, why could the outer core be stratified? When did this stratification happen? And how much stratification exists today? So we can start by looking at existing models of properties of the whole outer core. And you see some velocity models on the left and some density models on the right here. These seismological models are great, but like all models, they're not yet perfect. They're often parameterized for simplicity instead of being grounded in physics. They're often based on older data. That's especially true of density models. There is some disagreement between body wave models and normal mode models, and that's especially apparent if we look at the velocities here near the core mantle boundary. All of these aspects make these existing models less useful for other scientists who are trying to understand the bulk properties of the whole outer core. Let's now talk briefly about this possible layer at the top of the outer core. I'm going to be calling this layer an E-prime layer. This is just following Bullen's traditional notation. But Brzezinski had a much more poetic phrase. He calls it the hidden ocean of the core. If this layer exists and there is dynamical evidence to support its existence, it's of the order of tens to hundreds of kilometers thick. There is evidence from observations of things like Mach waves. There are some suggestions from satellite observations of the magnetic field and from geomagnetic jerk data that there is stratification at the top of the outer core. But other studies see no stratification or are unable to image it. And so if there could be a layer there, the next question we want to ask is, what made this happen? Why is there a layer there? There are several different suggestions. The first one is that light, element, uh, light elements are concentrated into the outer core as the inner core grows, and these light elements are buoyant, so they rise up to the core mantle boundary. Going in the opposite direction, there have been proposals that actually the mantle is slowly dissolving into the core, again giving us a flux of light elements. 
Some people propose that there, this is part of the planetary formation story, or maybe even a remnant of the moon forming impact. And finally, there are several different groups who've proposed that maybe materials at the properties of the outer core are in some cases immiscible, so that we have layers with different compositions at different depths, just because mixing isn't possible. So these are the things which could generate an E-prime layer. One might then want to ask, what would this look like seismically? What do seismologists currently image? And so here I show you what I might refer to as a zoo of models. We see all of these models are plotted relative to PREM, which is shown here as this orange line near the top. We see that there are a number of different models, all with slightly different predictions. Some of these models suggest a seismically anomalous layer, which we could identify as being stratified. Some of these models are instead smooth and maybe represent an outer core with no stratification. So what can we do? Let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the most simple case and see what seismology can bring to bear on this task. What we decided to do was try and make a new improved model of the properties of the whole bulk outer core to start with. This model has both the seismic properties, so the velocity and the density of the outer core, but it actually gives us the mineralogical properties of the core material as well. We had to make an ass some assumptions to build this model. To start with, we're going to assume that the outer core is well mixed everywhere. We're also going to assume that PREM, the preliminary reference Earth model, does a good job everywhere else in the Earth. We will relax both of these assumptions later in this conversation. What we did to model the outer core was to seek the equation of state for the outer core. And that gives us the bulk modulus of core material, its pressure derivative, and the molar volume of core material. From those, we can get the velocity and density. And by using an equation of state, what we're able to do is come up with a physics-based and physics-grounded model. We were also able to use new data. So the data that we're using to perform this task are normal mode center frequencies. We've taken them from multiple sources. Center frequencies of whole Earth oscillations, or normal modes, are particularly sensitive to 1D structure of the Earth. So these normal mode data are a really good way to interrogate the 1D or radially dependent structure of the Earth, and in particular for our case, the outer core. So these vibrational frequencies are our data. And our modeling process goes something like this. We want an equation of state and a seismic model which best fit our data. We do this in a Bayesian fashion, first by choosing values for the equation of state parameters, taking those values and using them to predict the velocity and predict the density of the outer core, using the velocity and density to predict the normal mode frequencies, and then comparing those predictions with observations. And then because this is a Bayesian inversion, we go back and we do it again and again and again, thousands and thousands of times. And we come up with a new model. Our new model is called epoch Vinay. Epoch stands for elastic parameters of the outer core, and this is a Vinay equation of state. So I'm going to briefly talk you through what our model tells us. First of all, you see on the left the velocity model. You actually have two sigma error bars plotted here, but they're so tight that you can hardly see the dashed lines. In the center of the well-mixed core, we see good agreement between prem in orange and epoch Vinay in green. Near the core mantle boundary, in terms of velocity, you see lower values, which are much more congruent with the values from body wave models. When you look at the density model, it seems that the modes want the density of the outer core to be a bit higher than we expected, a bit higher than that of PREM. And as we've used PREM elsewhere, that leads us to have some remaining concerns about mass conservation. But the normal modes really do prefer this epoch Vinay model because it's built for them. So the next question we want to ask is, does this help us with body wave observations? And so to do that, we use SMKS body waves. They're waves which bounce on the underside of the core mantle boundary, and we can look at their relative travel times for different pairs of these phases. We looked in the literature, and we found that Helfrig and Kanashima had published some values. So here I'm showing you a chart with their published values for the data on this zero line here. If a model perfectly predicts the data, the model would plot on that zero line too. If we look at what models actually predict, we find that our new model, Epoch Vinay, predicts the body wave data better than PREM. It predicts the body wave data better than IASP91 or AK135. If you're not a seismologist, these are popular, commonly used models. 
And we're really happy that our model does a good job, even though we use no data of this kind to make it. But we made a lot of simplifying assumptions when we made Epoch Vinay. It's the best simple model we think you can make. But what if there's an E prime layer there anyway? Using the same methodology, methodology I've already described, we can go from a model which has three parameters, Epoch Vinay, to a model which has an overwhelming six parameters for 319 data points. What we've done is we've added an E prime layer with a width that can vary, a velocity anomaly that can vary, and a density anomaly that can vary. And then we've repeated this whole inversion procedure. I'm going to briefly here show you the results of that inversion procedure, only briefly because the results are a little bit perplexing and a little bit disappointing. We have a model, it fits the data a bit better, but when we look at our model in detail, we find that it has a very slow velocity at the core mantle boundary, likely too slow to fit any of those body wave observations. When we look at the density, we actually also find something equally perplexing, which is that the density just here is actually higher in the E prime layer than it would be in a well mixed outer core, which means you've got extra dense things at the top. That seems concerning from a physics point of view, if nothing else. And if you want something to be enriched in light elements, that's also a little bit concerning. The modes that we're using that particularly care about the top of the outer core, though, it turns out also care about the D double prime. So inspired by this sort of information and also by the sorts of models that Raj Malik is making, I think he's going to talk about those later, we actually went a step further and did another suite of inversions. In this extra suite of inversions, we've had an outer core, which is well mixed, with an unwell mixed E prime layer at the top. We've also allowed the properties of the D double prime to vary. In this particular suite of inversions, we've also slightly restricted how wide this E prime layer can be. When we do that, we find new model results and we find models of the outer core which we think are maybe much more physically realistic. So specifically, when we allow the D double prime to change and the E prime to change, our velocity model is a lot like Prem and Epoch in the well-mixed outer core. But if we zoom into the E prime layer, it's got a very thin E prime layer, maybe just over 30 kilometers thick with a small velocity drop. If we look at the density model we find, Although you can't see it at this scale, the density is actually a little bit less than well mixed. So now we have a light element layer that's light, which is, you know, better. Um, we also find that the mass of this outer core is much closer to the mass of Prem's outer core. So we've reconciled that problem with not getting the mass of the Earth quite right, which was one of our residual concerns. So with this E prime layer and D double prime change is possible, we can then go ahead and ask ourselves the same question. How do we do for those body wave data that were published? And so here you're seeing predictions just from three models, from Prem, from Epoch Vinay, and this new model with D double prime structure and an E prime layer present. And the new model, despite the fact it again uses no body wave data, does better than any of those other models to predict these body wave data. So we were reassured by this finding. But these are not very many data we're comparing against here. There are only nine data points with reasonable sized error bars. So the final thing that we thought would be constructive and useful for us to do is to try and compare our results to a new bigger data set. This is work led by Wembo Wu, and he has developed a new subarray based iterative method to strip out interfering phases to make these body wave measurements of relative travel time arrivals. When we look at his measurements shown here, relative to Prem, which is the horizontal black line, you'll see that all of the measurements, all of the symbols basically plot above Prem. Prem is a little bit fast. The empty symbols are before you correct for mantle structure. The colored symbols are when you have corrected for mantle structure. And I'm showing you here two lines, Epoch Vinay at the top and Kanashima and Helfrich's KHOMC model. You can see that in general, both of those models represent the fact that Prem is a bit too fast. It may well be that KHOMC, which was built to fit this kind of data, does better. But what we find is that both of these models do a reasonable job at improving upon Prem. However, if we put our new model with E prime changes and D double prime changes in, we actually find that we seem to do a better job with these S3KS, S2KS data. We also have other phase combinations. Again, we seem to be doing a better job with these data. 
I would caveat here that I'm only showing you SMKS data. Because we have changed the D double prime in this model, there are knock-on effects for mantle sensitive phases, which I don't have time to talk about today. But we've made a new model which appears to obey the laws of physics for a change, which is kind of nice. So this new model was made using a Bayesian search, the first model for just an Vinay equation of state to fit the data. We subsequently allowed the presence of a stratified layer at the top of the outer core and permitted the D double prime to vary. These models better describe the outer core and have more physics in the well-mixed region than many previous models. There may be an E prime layer. If there is, it's likely to be thin, maybe of the order of 30, 40, 50 kilometers only, but we need to be very careful about trade-offs between the bottom of the mantle and the top of the outer core, and this work is still ongoing. These are our emerging views. Thank you. So any short comment or questions? No? Looks good. Thank you. Hi, these are short talks, and uh, I'm, uh, it was about five days ago when I uh, actually submitted this talk to the, to the, uh, the center here, and uh, I hope I remember what uh, I'm supposed to say, but hopefully by the end of the talk I will, and then it'll, I won't be wasting your time and I won't look like a fool up here myself. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, transfer of SiO2 from the core to the mantle. And I'm going to be emphasize, emphasizing more the chemistry aspects of this as opposed to the physics one, which uh, Jessica Irving talked about. And to start this, uh, this thing off, I want to just uh, 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 remember the, uh, the technological advancements that have made uh, improved our understanding of the, of the mineralogy and processes which are going on in the lower mantle and core. And basically, they've come about because of the development of multi-anvil presses and diamond anvil cells, which have allowed those uh, pressure temperature regimes to be interrogated. Plus, uh, too big to show here, but also synchrotron uh, sources of very bright x-rays, which allow uh, in situ observations of experiments and so forth. So there's a lot of technological stuff that goes on behind here that should be acknowledged. So the <clears throat> the Sort of situation I want you to focus back on is the planetary formation scenario, which is diagrammed by this um, cartoon that you see on the, the left side of, of the screen here. And really the most profound event that happened in the formation of a planet uh, is the separation of iron-rich materials from silicate-rich uh, materials. And what this winds up doing is it sets up a competition or, or actually a a, uh, between uh, elements preferences for one type of material, um, metal versus silicate for the other preferences. And you can parameterize this by the, 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 the preference of a, of a particular element for one or the other by a ratio, which is never zero or infinity because elements are never completely sequestered in one part or another part. But, these lead to what, what are called partition coefficients that govern uh, the composition of the metal, and in this case, the light elements that show up in the core and the elements that want to stay in the, in the silicate mantle itself. So from experiments that uh, K. Rose's group has done on uh, the solubility of, of, in particular, the light elements silicon and, and oxygen in liquid iron, then uh, on the left side, what you see is uh, a, 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 an image of the, of the comp composition of the, the run after, after it's done, after it's been heated in a diamond anvil cell at uh, conditions that are within the core, <clears throat> essentially. And you can see the presence of purple uh, SiO2 that's crystallized out of material, which is effectively the green background which was homogeneous um, SiO and Fe mixed at an atomic scale by essentially by starting off with vapor deposition of the sample. 
and you can see how, how SiO2 has effectively exalted from the, the metal. So you can model this, uh, model a series of experiments and parameterize it and come up with the triangular diagram that you see on the right, which is composition iron at the top, uh, silicon down on the left side, lower left side, and oxygen on the lower right side, which give you sort of solubility limits for SiO2 in the liquid iron as a function of temperature. So you can imagine that as the core cools from, an, from initially high temperatures that SiO2 would be exalved because uh, you move from effectively uh, the, a lower part of this diagram that has more Si and O in it to a higher part of this diagram which is more iron rich as SiO2 crystallizes and, and the core cools. So the, uh, now, now you, you can look at a physical um, uh, visualization of core formation and there, at some uh, stage during the uh, planetary formation process, there was an impact of, of, uh, of planetesimals and a giant impact that probably formed the Earth mo Earth, Earth's moon that uh, heats the surface of the planet. You have uh, 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 heating, which actually um, uh, uh, is the separation process by which uh, iron, uh, metal separates from silicate because uh, metal has a lower melting temperature and it's much more dense and it, it essentially descends into the center of the planet to a lower gravitational potential and uh, separates uh, metal from silicate. And the diagram on the right just shows you how, how different the melting temperatures of, of uh, metal alloys that are based on iron and, and what uh, silicates are. And in the process of this, um, uh, what would you call it, hellish exchange or a set of conditions that wind up separating metal from silicate, then you wind up putting potentially silicon and oxygen into the metal that gets carried into the core, and then as the core cools down, then it sets up the conditions where this, this comes out. Now, uh, Jessica Irving talked about the seismic observations for a uh, uh, lower seismic wave speeds at the, at the top of the outer core. So you've seen this diagram once before that's on the left of your screens that shows uh, the S waves which go into the core, turn to P waves, and bounce multiple times off the bottom. And, and a, as a consequence, by looking at different combinations of those waves then you, on, in the diagram on the left, then you can look at different depths in, inside the core. And if there's a possibility that SiO2 is being exalted by the core as the core cools, then you can think of a saturation level uh, that, that defines the limit of solubility of SiNO in the core. And at some level, just like you have in the atmosphere where clouds form because the, uh, the atmosphere becomes oversaturated in, in water vapor, then you form clouds, which is liquid water. You could have an analogous, possibly, layer forming as the core cools in, in the core itself. So one of the interpretations of one of these so-called so layers or the way that it, the, it arises in the core is that you hit essentially the cloud level in the core for the saturation of SiO2 and then the uh, material comes out and goes up to the core. Now it turns out that one of the things that we know is that a dynamo or the magnetic, Earth's magnetic field has been operating for a very long time, at least three and a half billion years and from magnetism of, of uh, meteorites that are very old. Even in small uh, protoplanetary bodies, dynamos have been operating. So a very effective way to run dynamos is by crystallizing material out of, out of metal. This produces buoyancy. It sets up convection currents. It, it gives you a, an energy source that can drive convection and drive a magnetic field. And to show you how efficiently this thing works, you have a diagram that's here on the right which shows on, on the bottom axis the uh, total dissipation that's guessed to need, that's required to run the Earth's dynamo. And uh, on the vertical axis, you can see how much cooling is required in the planet. Uh, and on the right, this is just translated into the rate of crystallization of SiO2. And <clears throat> if you look at the blue line on the bottom, then you can see that to, to run a dynamo for effectively uh, four billion years, you only need to cool the core by, by about 50 to 150 K, okay? So you don't have to do tremendous amounts of cooling because of the extra latent heat and buoyancy that's liberated by the crystallization of material. The green line on the, on the top shows how much 
cooling of the core you would require if you just wanted to run it by, by thermal dynamo alone and to drive the convection in the core. So, so chemistry really makes the system run much easier than does uh, just reg regular heat conduction. Now the possibility of this is that if you have in the, this hellish time of formation of the, or addition of light elements to the Earth's core, that you put in silicon and oxygen in, into them, then when this comes out from the cloud layer that I talked about, in this, in this case, the, uh, the, 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 the SiO2 being less dense goes up, accumulates at the core mantle boundary, and then it would form a boundary of SiO2 at the, at the core mantle boundary that because the SiO2 is even less dense than the mantle itself, would want to rise and go in, into the mantle. So this kind of situation where you have a less dense layer under a more dense layer will set up a fluid dynamical instability that's called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability and the surface becomes bumpy and then detaches into diapirs that go in, in, into the mantle. Now it's possible that what that would do is that if there's any material that prefers uh, silicate as opposed to metal that was reluctantly incorporated into the metal at the time the core formed, then this could be transferred into the silicate that's evolved within the, met with within the core itself and therefore come back into the mantle at a much late later stage and sort of re-fertilize uh, the mantle with these elements. So there's possibility of a cycling of elements between the core and the mantle, which, is, which hasn't been envisioned before, only, uh, only in, in the limited sense of exchange at the core mantle boundary itself instead of something that's, that's actually evolved from the body of the core itself. Now it's possible that you might see uh, traces of this uh, SiO2 that was released from the core during, form, during uh, early Earth days when the core was cooling from an initial very high temperature to the temperature that it, has, that it has now, in the form of SiO2 bodies that might be incorporated in, into the mantle right now. There are some seismic observations that show uh, scattering, or let's see the, uh, how to put it, this in layman's term. If this was the bad old days and everybody in the room smoked, then there would be this haze of material that was in the room that would cause my ability to see you to be diminished. And you can characterize that by a sort of turbidity of the mantle, which you can also characterize seismically. And the diagram that you see on the left side here is a, is a proxy for the turbidity of the mantle seen by seismic waves as you go down. And it turns out that the level at which SiO2 is neutrally buoyant in the mantle turns out to be about the level at which these curves actually come uh, either attain a peak or a constant level in the mantle. So there's some suggestion that this material might be old SiO2 evolved early in the core that's still sit sitting in the mantle itself. Uh, they, also SiO2 loss uh, can be used to put limits on the composition of the core itself. I think I'm running out of time so I won't go into this in depth. but. Essentially, what we know about the, the composition of the inner core right now, which is that it has a, a small amount of, of light element. If you crystallize SiO2 and want to make an inner core that looks like the one we know today seismologically, then the composition of the early Earth has to lie somewhere in that blue uh, triangle. So you can use that. And then there's, you, from setting up a budget of silicon in the core, you can also calculate what the signature of SiO2 that's transferred from the core into the mantle would look like if it was identifiable in mantle uh, 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 um, uh, inclusions, at which would most likely be trapped in diamonds. So this is a call out to people that study diamonds to perhaps look for at the stable silicon isotopes in diamonds and you might find something in, about this process in the lower mantle. The other thing that might happen is that the material, the silicate that comes out of the core itself would look like uh, the, the composition that you see in this, in this uh, pink area that's at the lower right of this compositional diagram that shows magnesium, iron, and silicon ox oxide. And the silicate matter that would be crystallized from the core would come out about there. If fractional crystallization happens as this uh, material accumulates at the core mantle boundary and, and the, and the uh, 
and the silicate gets incorporated back into the mantle, then it turns out that, that about one to two volume percent of the lower mantle could be formed from this expelled silicate from the, the mantle, which if you think about the volume of D double prime, then it might be associated with that. And this also gives you a basis for calculating a budget for element, light element transfer between the mantle and the core itself. So uh, I think I'm at the end, and I just want to leave you with this idea that, that uh, the core may be evolving SiO2 right now. It may, be involved, it may be responsible for the structure that you see at the top of the outer core, the E, e, e prime layer, E layer, that uh, the previous speaker was talking about. Thanks. Okay, so we have time for short question. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree. This is in its infancy, and, and calculating what that phase might be would be of interest to me. It, it's probably at some point it's going to be a melt, but at other points it would be a solid. Right. Thank you. So let's move on. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, present uh, the progress thus far on the, on the 3D reference Earth model. Uh, for details, please head to the poster uh, that has been shown today. I will primarily focus on the methodological underpinnings of the project and why it is providing new insights on the Earth's deep interior. Uh, seismic studies of the Earth's interior have focused primarily on two sets of uh, approaches. One is looking at radial models in the Earth that describe properties uh, as a function of depth in a set of concentric shells. Um, these are representative of the bulk composition of the Earth and uh, phase transitions at various depths. And the other set of models that build on these uh, radial models are three-dimensional tomographic models that describe lateral variations in properties and show features such as, uh, such, such as uh, uh, tectonic signals in the upper uh, mantle, slab signals in the transition zone, and lo uh, low velocity provinces at the bottom of the mantle. Uh, what is not really appreciated uh, is that since we are moving towards much more finer scale variations, those actually depend a lot on, uh, uh, on the underlying 3D model and in turn on the radial model. So basically, we have come to a stage where we can no longer treat these things in isolation and need a joint approach. There are three main reasons why we need that. The first is purely driven by uh, the community. So uh, based on uh, recent estimates of um, mineralogical properties from experiments and ab initio calculations, uh, we, know, uh, we know the thermodynamically consistent uh, uh, phase proportions of minerals uh, with depth and properties in much finer detail. Uh, so for example, this is a calculation from Hephaesto uh, that describes how shear wave velocity varies with depth for, an, uh, for a geotherm that has an upper uh, thermal boundary layer and a lower thermal boundary layer with super adiabatic gradients. Uh, they, sh they, both, they show phase transitions at, in the transition zone and another phase transition at, at post-perovskite 
uh, transition at the, in the low, lowermost mantle. Uh, absolute velocity, velocities are complementary to geochemical isotopic constraints on, uh, that show a distinct signal between MORB and uh, ocean island basalts. And so they inform, uh, uh, absolute properties inform ge ge geodynamic models. So seismic studies of absolute velocities and density can therefore calibrate all of these uh, interconnected studies. The second reason why we need to treat them uh, jointly is because of this rapid explosion in data. We, we can see that in the last, uh, last um, 19 years, there has been a six-fold increase in the number of stations and a three-fold increase in the number of earthquakes that, we, that have been recorded. What is immediately clear is that this data is not uh, homogeneous. We have more sampling in the northern hemisphere. These are travel times of P waves as a function of epicentral distance, which is a proxy for the sampling depth in the mantle. And then you can notice that PREM uh, uh, systematically has uh, lower, uh, smaller travel times that are indicative of a bias towards faster velocities. So if you want to make, uh, make an average model of the Earth, you need to remove this bias. And this, is, this assumes more importance because there has been agreement in the community that uh, uh, low velocity provinces are preferentially located in the southern hemisphere. The third reason for combining uh, joint, combining uh, heterogeneity and radial models is uh, slightly more theoretical. So uh, this is average surface wave phase velocities as a function of frequency. This is again a proxy for depth. And you can notice this uh, discrepancy in velocities from two different st uh, studies from uh, Ekstrom at Lamont and Scripps, they both agree on the values. And this uh, love radial discrepancy has traditionally been attributed purely to radial variations in uh, radial anisotropy. In fact, uh, it is often assumed that uh, there is no contribution of lateral heterogeneity uh, to, to this data. However, it can be shown now that uh, the contribution from from uh, the strongly heterogeneous crustal, uh, crustal uh, heterogeneity has a nonlinear effect and contributes substantially to the Rayleigh wave and the love wave dispersion. So in fact, they can't be averaged out and you need to treat them both together. So born by these understandings, we, uh, we believe that there are four uh, guiding principles for the reference earth model project. And I'm first going to focus on the data aspect. Uh, there is a recent uh, impetus on fitting full waveforms, such as these uh, from, the, uh, from the Sumatra 2004 earthquake, 9.0, uh, that are recorded at the uh, CTAO station uh, in Australia. And you can see that you can either try to fit the full waveform, but you can also leverage the existing expertise in the community and uh, that, that, ha that uh, the existing wisdom uh, that process data between at various frequencies. So these are uh, in time domain, but then you can also look at really long time series in frequency domain and you'll see uh, these normal modes at really long periods. So what we have done is work with the community to come up with, uh, 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 work with the domain experts to come up with scalable data formats that can preserve the metadata that goes into these calculations. And it turns out that if you do that, uh, do that process, then most of uh, uh, some, the data sets can be reconciled. So surface wave, uh, this, these are velocities of 100 seconds uh, Rayleigh waves between two studies from Utrecht and uh, um, uh, this is, I can't see. This is from Utrecht, and this is uh, Rissama et al., uh, Rissama and co-authors. And you can see to first order, they are very, they're seeing the same Earth, right? And the same happens for body waves. So they can also, this is the reflection from the 410 and 660 discontinuity. And the green curves uh, and the black dots are two sets of different kinds of measurements. And to first order, they have very similar kind of information. So in essence, we are seeing the same, we're sampling the same Earth, 
uh, through different lenses, and we need to reconcile that before we attribute too much importance to one set of data. So the second, set, the second prong of this project is the theoretical framework. And uh, the idea behind this is that there is no single method that is a panacea. So we need to work together as a community to co uh, have complementary benefits. So I won't go into details of this, but uh, Ekstrom and I have been working on combining different data sets uh, that span different frequencies uh, and constrain heterogeneity at various spatial scales. And more recently, we have added uh, other types of data shown in green. I won't have time to go into the details of this. So let's talk about what we recover in terms of structure. And the idea here is that we want to first capture the first order features before we make assumptions about the second order features. So we have, uh, in, in, in order to con construct uh, uh, a model of bulk structure, we need uh, a model of 1D variations in the Earth. So this is a new radial reference Earth model that uh, has variations shown in VP, VS, density, and this is an anisotropic parameter with depth. And uh, what I'll focus on is on the boundary layers of the mantle, because that's where all of this uh, techniques actually have, have the most impact. So the first is the shallowest mantle. So you can see radial anisotropy plotted as a function of depth. Prem has a monotonically decreasing uh, uh, anisotropy with depth. But, uh, and, but our model sees uh, substantial anisotropy in the mantle lithosphere. So this is a pervasive phenomenon. And uh, there is a peak in anisotropy at around 130 kilometer depth. The other feature that we see is this discrepancy between the peak anisotropic depth and the peak attenuation depth. So on average, the Earth behaves as if there is a weak decoupling layer uh, in, at atmospheric depths, and anisotropy forms right above that. Further analysis is needed to figure out the details of this. The, the, uh, if you compare, compare the anisotropic uh, values with uh, flow models from uh, Becker et al. With, uh, um, with dislocation creep in olivine, it can be captured by lateral viscosity variations, except that the peak is slightly shifted, so maybe geodynamic models need to make their LAB uh, shallower, not 100 kilometers. Um, the other thing is that uh, they also predict much smaller anisotropy at mantle lithospheric depths, which is probably some kind of frozen in anisotropy. There is also this discrepancy, uh, but as uh, the, the, SNS, uh, the attenuation peak has been observed before in other studies, such as Dalton et al. and Selby and Woodhouse. In fact, uh, they're almost identical. However, if you impose a starting model that is like PREM, you don't recover this. So if you compare uh, our velocity models with predictions from mineral physics for different compositions in pyrolite in red and basalt in blue here, uh, pyrolytic composition predicts the, uh, the comp compression velocity variations in our model fairly well and has those jumps at the, in the transition zone. However, that falls apart at the lowermost mantle where we observe negative gradients in VP and VS, but a positive gradient in density. Um, so basalt in red, sorry, uh, pyrolite in red cannot capture all these three observations at the same time. You need, based on current measurements, uh, you need some amount of uh, basalt enrichment. So post-perovskite cannot be the scapegoat for every feature on, in, uh, in the lowermost mantle. We have, uh, so this is a, an example of a pervasive uh, 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 chemical, uh, chemical heterogeneity, but what about where, where is it located? Is it preferentially located in some regions? Turns out, yes. So we published this, in these, uh, this paper that talks comprehensively about different signatures of heterogeneity, uh, and it turns out that if you compare uh, uh, our values of VS uh, and VP variations, ratios of that, as a function of depth, so that's in red, and compare it with Suan Zuwanski and Masters et al., uh, we see a progressive increase in the scaling ratio, so that's one signature. The second signature is this associated decrease and uh, uh, anti-correlation anti in the lowermost mantle. The third is this 
wide variety of scaling ratios that is seen in the lowermost mantle. And we also saw the density, uh, the, 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 there is dense material right beneath the superplumes, which is shown by this anti-correlation. So in essence, uh, we have a, a highly heterogeneous layer uh, that is preferentially distributed beneath superplumes. There are other signatures of uh, thermochemical heterogeneity. So for example, this is our model um, and uh, at a depth of 2,800 kilometers. And this is the uh, power at different scales. As a, uh, and you can see that for a ther purely thermal simulation, the power fall off is fairly flat, whereas a thermochemical simulation can capture this to first order. So not only is the lowermost mantle uh, an interesting boundary layer, uh, it also has implications for, our, our results have implications for the out, outermost outer core, where we see a Bullens parameter that is substantially different from one. Uh, in the uppermost mantle, uh, obviously you have super adiabatic gradients related to the thermal boundary layer, sub adiabatic gradients that are representative of the phase transitions. But this is significant and substantially different from PREM, which is in red. We, if you calculate the, uh, if you calculate the brunt uh, frequency, it is clear that there is a strong drop-off in the outermost outer core. And this, is, this value is negative, which implies an unstably or intermittent, uh, inter intermittently stratified E prime layer. So the third part, the fourth prong of this project uh, is community tools. So we have developed a set of community tools that you can go explore uh, in this poster. And the idea behind it is that you, you want to leverage the existing expertise that has been accumulated over several decades. Uh, and I, I, welcome, I welcome you to join us in exploring, uh, the, uh, exploring heterogeneity and finding its absolute values uh, in a multi-scale framework where we have long wavelength variations in some areas of the Earth, uh, in, uh, everywhere on Earth, but finer resolution at continental scales and even finer resolutions at local scales. And for, th for this, you can go explore this poster. Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's move on to the next talk. Okay, we'll, we'll go without a pointer. Hello, it's Thursday. <laughs> so uh, I was going to uh, talk to you guys today about the detection of an iron spin transition in uh, the lower mantle. I think uh, this is a very interesting project because people have been working on the iron spin transition for many years in the mineral physics community. And uh, a lot of the aspects of this transition and how it works are, are more or less well accepted. However, in terms of seismological detection and uh, being able to image what's going on in the mantle and the role that this plays, it uh, hasn't really found any definitive evidence. And it's one of these rare circumstances, I think, where um, the mineral physics prediction precedes the uh, seismological observation. Uh, let's see. This one. So what is this? Uh, electron spin change or spin crossover, spin transition. Um, basically, does that work? There we go. That'll be my pointer. So in this case, this is for a spin transition in uh, ferropericlase. In the iron atoms, you have these uh, EG electrons here. At, this is the high spin state. And as you go to higher pressure, they uh, collapse down and they pair with these electrons in the T2G and this is called the low spin. So there's a high spin to low spin crossover here. Um, this is driven by pressure as there's a volume decrease associated with this uh, spin change. And because there's a volume decrease, it necessarily affects the bulk modulus. Uh, 
And because it affects the bulk modulus, that means that there should be some sort of effect on seismology or, or seismologically observable properties like uh, VP, for example. So the spin crossover is relatively broad. Um, it's narrower, we think, at cooler temperatures. And as the temperatures go up, the transition broadens. The mixed spin region becomes broader as you go to higher temperatures. Also, it becomes deeper. And so the spin transition experienced by cooler mantle, ambient mantle, and hot mantle is shifted both in depth as well as in uh, breadth. At this point, we can ask, you know, what is the composition of the lower mantle and should we expect to have ferropericlase in the lower mantle at all so that we could observe this transition? Well, there's a lot of ideas about what the bulk composition of the mantle might be. And of course, the, the lower mantle in particular is very uh, highly uncertain. Um, the ideas range from chondritic to solar to uh, models of the lower mantle whose composition is more like the upper mantle. And uh, depending on which of those you assume, you'll get different amounts of ferropericlase in the mixture. In particular, if the lower mantle is pyrolite-like, then you would expect there to be on roughly on the order of 20% ferropericlase in the lower mantle, in which case you would have a spin crossover. If you had more solar or, or chondritic, especially enstatite, chondrite type of uh, compositions, bulk compositions, you would not expect to see uh, spin crossover because you wouldn't have ferropericlase in those compositions. So the bulk modulus change. So again, I, as I mentioned before, the volume collapses and that means that the bulk modulus has to change. It's a thermodynamic fact. Um, this is a plot profiles of bulk modulus calculated by uh, Juan Valencia Cardona and uh, Renato Benskovic for a pyrolite-like composition with an iron number of 15 in ferropericlase. So what happens here is that the bulk modulus goes through this little dip as it goes through the mixed spin region. So here we have a cooler, an adiabatic, and then a hotter geo geotherm going through these regions, and they're producing these different bulk modulus profiles. You see what happens as a consequence of the shifting to different depths and the broadening is that the bulk modulus uh, at least for this composition, starts to overlap, and you lose the temperature sensitivity of bulk modulus. And that's a key aspect there, too. So you would expect, um, as you add even more ferropericlase or more iron in ferropericlase, that this actually can become reversed. So you can reverse the temperature dependence of bulk modulus, and, uh, and, and that's a very interesting effect, and that should be something we should scout for. If we look at both the shear and bulk modulus, the shear modulus is relatively unaffected. Um, if you were to then compute the S velocity and P velocity profiles for these different temperature geotherms through the region, you get these different uh, effects. It's very much visible in the P velocity. You see that P velocity loses its uh, dependence, strong dependence on temperature through this mixed spin region, whereas it stays the same in S velocity. And that's a key characteristic that we'll look for. Um, another thing is we could plot up what the VP would look like if we were to try and match PREM. And you have this big inflection here in VP, uh, which is not apparent in PREM. And uh, this might be a more exaggerated case, but this sort of variation would be definitely visible in uh, global models, seismic models. So we might also ask, why don't we see it in PREM? So to summarize this preliminary information, if uh, ferropericlase is present in the lower mantle for pyrolite-like composition, 20%, um, we would have all of these effects that accompany it. Owing to the density decrease, we have a bulk modulus softening. We have a de decrease in the temperature dependence of bulk modulus and VP as a consequence due to steepening and broadening of the bulk modulus softening at higher temperatures. And, uh, we have all these effects confined mostly to VP and DVPDT and very little effect on VS. So this is something that we should look for, but again, we don't see these effects in PREM for the average mantle. Uh, one caveat I should mention is that changes in FEMG partitioning between bridgmanite and ferroclase through this region could amplify or mute the signature of the spin transition, and this is something that still uh, needs to be sorted out. Um, however, 
if we do see some signature, seismological signature, that's consistent with the, the spin transition of ferropericlase, that might be a, a, an interesting independent constraint or target for mineral physics research. So what are the three options, given what we know here? Um, I, I think some seismologists have written off the spin transition, said it's fake news. Um, I don't think it's fake news. I think that there's, there's reality to, to deal with here, cold, hard facts that we have. Or seismology cannot resolve it, but I think this has also been explored, and um, it, it seems like it should be resolved. Something should, should appear there. Or perhaps the lower mantle is not homogeneous pyrolite or not pyrolytic, and that's a really interesting question because it, it has geochemical consequences as well as consequences for the evolution and structure of the interior. If we take this third option and we can make a hypothesis that perhaps subducted lithospheric slab, which penetrate into the lower mantle, will have the highest ferropericlase content of any rock in the lower mantle. They should have the most uh, effects of a spin change. So we should look for the spin transition in fast regions where slabs are going into the lower mantle. And that's what we're going to do here. To do this, we need to compare VP and VS behavior and look for mismatches. That's what's going to be the key thing. Um, However, comparing VP and VS to tomographic models is, is a tricky enterprise, and there's a lot of variations between models, both in amplitudes, the way they parameterize, the way they pick the data, the data sources, um, the regularization, many things. And so it can be very challenging to do so. Um, so we, we should try and find models that are mutually consistent, hopefully, to compare. Um, so we also should look at something that's independent of the absolute values of the amplitude of seismic velocity variations reported in the models because we don't believe those are correct. We think that those are just approximate. When we look at variations in amplitudes and seismic velocity variations in different models, we come up with differences of a factor of six between one model and another, which is a, a problem. So here's what we do. We take a series of P models and a series of S models. We start looking at uh, the fast regions. We don't use uh, seismic velocity amplitude as a constraint. Instead, we use the, the sigma. So we take the, the, the standard deviation, um, and then we look at how those behave with, with depth. So this is a profile of the percentage of material which falls within the contour of fast material that's faster than, say, 0.75 one and 1.25 sigma. You can see that no matter what you choose there for your cutoff, you get basically a similar trend. What we start to notice is that there are some different trends in the P models in the sense that they are starting to see more or, or a drop off in the abundance of very fast material as they go down through the mid mantle with the exception of this detox model, which has this kind of hump and then a decrease. Um, the S models, the S models, are actually increasing in abundance of fast material as you go down through the lower mantle. So that's a very distinct behavior, and actually you might say this could be some signal of the spin change because the P is supposed to lose its sensitivity to temperature as you go through the mixed spin region, whereas the S is not. And perhaps there's slabs that are resolved because the temperature is, is popping out in the VS but is muted in VP. So this is something we'll, we'll look into further. But we have to deal with this differences between the models and the fact that they're not all showing the same thing. There are individual model pairs which are more or less mutually, mutually consistent, like the HMSL models. Um, but we'd like to find a way to consult many models and not pick particular models to leverage our um, results on. So what we use is this me method called vote maps. This is something that was developed by Grace Shepard and, and, and colleagues, where they're looking for how many models agree that there is an anomaly of a certain kind in a certain location of the, the mantle. And this is a way of just saying how many models see this kind of thing, and can we look for consensus features. It doesn't add anything to the models that's not already in the models. It's just a way of asking do all these models see it, or is it just something that only this that model or that model sees? And of course, if only one of the models sees it, then it should be uh, taken as a suspect uh, feature. So basically, you contour things like I showed before in terms of uh, having a cutoff in the, in the standard deviation faster than some value. We choose one sigma as just a simple 
measure, you uh, contour within that, you combine all the models together and you ask how many of them see that feature in each location geographically and then you make a map as a vote map because it is the number of models that see the same kind of feature in the same place you have, has the most votes. So these uh, dark blue areas here, for example, are places where the, all of the models see a fast anomaly. So this is what it looks like at various depths for a uh, fast mantle, greater than one sigma, the vote maps, and the number of models that see features. Um, we do see things like the, the Farallon slab going down beneath the Americas. We see that, you know, the remnants of the Tethys and, and these over here. So a lot of robust features are coming out, things that we see. And the models do exhibit a lot of agreement on the places where we think these things are robust re resolved. In the VP, there seems to be a little bit of differences, but it's not easy to see from this plot. We can also do the same thing for slow mantle, and this will be interesting in a second, I'll, I'll, as I'll explain. But we can say what, what uh, um, amount of the lower mantle, how many models see uh, mantle that's less than one sigma from the, the, the mean of the model. So we've made these maps as well. Now if we plot then the area fraction of the models of, of, of the votes, the consensus vote maps uh, with depth, then we see this uh, trend appearing in, in all the models together. We see that the P models are detecting fewer slabs or fewer volume of slabs as they go down while the S models are picking up. And this happens around the place where we expect the spin transition to be uh, starting, around, say, 14, 15, 1600 kilometers depth. Um, when we look at the slow mantle, we see also a little bit of this decoupling. It looks like the P models are falling off here and the S models are, are continuously increasing. So this looks like a, a signal that appears to be consistent with the, the predictions of a spin transition. If we look at a side profile, here's a side view. Uh, for a long time, people who look at P models and compare them to S models have noticed that the, the P models seem to have a disappearing slabs in the mid mantle. They, get, they become weaker somehow. And this is something that we might be able then to attribute to the spin transition because these materials in VP are losing their, uh, their temperature dependence. What about the lack of the appearance in PREM? Well, I guess this is the way we might interpret this, is that we have regions that are more or less ferropericlase poor or free, uh, highly viscous wheels, for example, those beams, uh, where you have pyrolytic mantle circulating down and up through conduits or channels between them. And so that's the summary, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so we have to move on to the next talk. So today I want to share with you some of our experimental results and uh, results also from simulations uh, that uh, talk about or will try to answer some questions about not only mantle composition but the heterogeneities um, that we see uh, and how this may influence the thermochemical evolution of the mantle as a whole. Uh, this, is, uh, this will include several projects uh, that my uh, group and I uh, have been doing over the years, so we'll include many um, data from former students, postdocs, uh, and collaborators. So as we know, and, uh, from both seismology as well as through convection simulations, uh, heterogeneities in the mantle are not only prevalent, but they are global. Uh, in here, uh, we, we see from this particular uh, tomographic model uh, that uh, the red here uh, shows uh, 
uh, slow features, oh, slow velocities, and the blue uh, would be the fast velocities. And they're colored, um, or have been traditionally colored, uh, to represent sort of the hot and cold, uh, perhaps hot and cold regions um, of the Earth. And so to look uh, for sort of answers of, of you know, why we have these heterogeneities, uh, what we're going to do first is we are going to uh, run some experiments, and we're going to synthesize uh, mantle glasses. And so in particular, we're going to look at a peroxinite assemblage, and we're going to synthesize these uh, glasses um, such that they have the same composition but only differ in their ferric iron content. We're then going to take these samples and we're going to apply high pressures and high temperatures to reproduce the conditions within, uh, within the planet. Using X-ray diffraction, we're going to identify the minerals and measure their volumes with pressure, therefore their equations of state. We're then going to look at the chemistry of the phases that are formed at these high pressures and high temperatures by cross-sectioning our samples with the focus ion beam and using um, electron microscopy to measure their compositions. We use then uh, the constraints from our measurements as well as a few assumptions to do some Monte Carlo uh, simulations to then determine the abundance of the phases of the minerals that are formed and uh, then with this, with then our uh, most probable uh, assemblages, we're then going to be using a mineral physics toolkit, Burnman, to then compute the densities, the assemblage densities and seismic velocities. And then again, uh, again, taking all of this now to uh, run some convection simulations. So if that was <laughs> not a mouthful, uh, certainly the, uh, oh, not yet, quite. So what kind of uh, mantle compositions are we going to be looking at? Uh, this is, we're building on um, some previous experiments, but um, here are some that are unpublished. So this particular uh, set of samples was based on a mixed 1G peroxinite uh, provided by um, Mark Hirschman, or as shown by Mark Hirschman about 15 years ago. And so we're going to try to mimic this particular composition. Uh, this particular composition was thought to be a good parent body for ocean island basalts. And so if we think ocean island basalts come from depth, then this may be a, a good way to find some uh, heterogeneities in the mantle. So what I want to um, show you here is, uh, in particular, the ferric iron content of these two uh, samples um, are quite different. And so for the purposes of this uh, talk and this study, I'm going to be referring to the one with low ferric iron content of about 10% as the reduced uh, sample or the mixed reduced sample, and, um, and the oxidized version, which has more than 50% uh, ferric iron. Now, for those of you who are interested, along the bottom here, I show uh, what these um, particular starting samples look like compared to natural peroxinites that are out there in the literature. So this is just looking at the PETDB uh, database, and our samples uh, are here in the, in the diamonds. Okay, so we have quite a lot of alumina in the starting samples, but overall they look just like uh, many of the other peroxinites that are naturally found. Uh, for, those of, for reference, um, pyrolite is shown here in the blue diamonds. Uh, excuse me, blue triangles. All right, so here is all the data that, um, or a subset of all the data that we've collected uh, on these two uh, separate set of samples. Okay, so on the left-hand side are our results from the reduced version of this peroxinite. Okay, so up here uh, in the left-hand side, we have some X-ray diffraction patterns um, that are shown um, at various pressures, and this, uh, from this diffraction, we can, uh, we can deduce that this assemblage is dominated by bridgmanite, um, calcium perovskite, uh, and other accessory phases like uh, calcium ferrite structured phase, alumina, stichivite, and a little bit of metallic iron. On the other hand, on the right-hand side here is the oxidized uh, set of uh, X-ray diffraction patterns, and these are also at the same um, uh, same pressures and sy synthesize the same pressures and temperatures. Okay, and, and so we have also a set of diffraction lines here. All of these diffraction peaks can be ascribed to just bridgmanite. Okay, and so despite having the same 
a starting material, just a difference in the ferric iron content, but the total amount of iron is the same, we see that we've, uh, we've formed different assemblages. Now, if we look just at the bridgmanite formed between these two, two different sets of samples, uh, we find that their volumes are quite different. Okay, so in blue uh, are our reduced volumes for the bridgmanite compared to the oxidized uh, volumes. And their volume difference is about 3%. So this is quite sizable. Now, as I mentioned before, we took these samples then and we cross-sectioned them and look at the, at the chemical composition. And so uh, here is our, our, the composition maps, the elemental maps uh, that, we found, uh, <clears throat> that we found for, uh, for these samples. Okay? And so what you can see on the reduced one, um, it is quite uh, heterogeneous and is consistent with a diffraction of many phases, whereas the oxidized uh, cross-sections are quite homogeneous, again, consistent with just a single phase of bridgmanite. So focusing in on the bridgmanite, why are these bridgmanites so different, and, why, and, and is this uh, the reason for such a different uh, phase assemblage? Okay. So uh, th using the, the chemical compositions that were measured by electron microscopy and then using um, a Monte, uh, Monte Carlo, so you know, taking our uncertainties and being able to vary them and seeing what actually fits the data, we were able to de deduce uh, very, very well the compositions of these particular bridgmanites. Okay. So on the top uh, would be the chemical composition of the bridgmanites formed in the reduced samples. And you can see that the volume is, the room pressure volume is quite different, again, from the oxidized version um, of the sample. You'll also notice that in the oxidized sample that there's quite a lot of calcium. Now, there was lots of calcium in the starting composition, and because there was no calcium perovskite phase formed, uh, in the um, oxidized sample, because there was just a single phase, all that calcium needed to, it has to be uh, accommodated within the bridgmanite structure. <clears throat> we think that this is possible uh, because of the high ferric iron and the coupled then uh, inclusion of the aluminum also in this uh, bridgmanite, which then act to increase the unit cell volume of bridgmanite thereby being able to stuff in the rather large uh, calcium ion. <clears throat> so now we have a composition and we have an assemblage of, of, uh, you know, of, of phases, so then we can compute the density throughout the mantle for, um, for these particular assemblages. And so what's shown here are the reduced and oxidized assemblages in blue and red, respectively, um, as compared to prem in black. Okay. And if we, just, if we just look at the difference between the reduced and oxidized uh, assemblages, we find that on average the density is different by just over 1%, okay, where the reduced assemblage is denser than its oxidized counterpart. So we take this density contrast, right? Again, this density contrast, the difference in these starting materials was just in the ferric iron content. Okay? So the total amount of iron is the same between the two. <clears throat> so we can take this difference in, in density, which is also consistent with uh, previous published uh, paper, uh, studies uh, from, from, our, from my group, and, um, and we can look at see how this, uh, what this would mean for convection. Okay, so as this is running, I wanna just show you. So on the top panel is the viscosity. Uh, you'll notice that between the upper and the lower mantle, there is a line that is an increase of viscosity of about a factor of 50. In the middle panel is the temperature, so uh, blue is cold, red is, is hot, as is normal convention. And then on the bottom panel shows how the density is evolving with this convection model. Okay? So here, uh, the blue stuff is the denser material, um, and the warmer the color is the, uh, the lighter material. Okay, <clears throat> so let me just show you some snapshots of this as it runs. Now this whole, this, this uh, simulation runs for about the age of the Earth. Okay. And so if we look at just some snapshots from, um, from this convection model, we first start off with a 50-50, an even distribution of light and heavy 
material. So it would uh, correspond to the dense material, which is the reduced, and the lighter oxidized material. The, um, the coloring is in buoyancy number, so this is all showing density. So a, a buoyancy number of 0.8 is, is 2%. A buoyancy number of zero is no difference in, um, so no density contrast. Okay, so the, uh, a black or red value is going to be no density contrast as compared to blue, which is a 2%. So this is, a, this is, this is um, our starting guess. Now Im immediately, this is, you know, it starts off very artificially as this um, just, you know, just kind of a random distribution. This quickly goes away. Um, as, the, as the model continues to run, um, where we have the heavier, the heavier material sinking. With time, it uh, mixes up, and then by the end of the simulation, what we find is that we've got these blue denser piles along the core mantle boundary, and then uh, sort of warmer colors, uh, or the lighter oxidized material uh, more towards the surface. Now we can also calculate the velocities, the seismic velocities of these assemblages and compare them. And, <clears throat> and, and these are much easier to see the differences. So VP is on the left-hand side and VS is shown on the right. Again, oxidizes in, in red, uh, reduces in blue. And the differences are quite astonishing. Uh, we see you know, 10% difference in VP and about up to 30% difference in VS. Now, granted, there's a huge caveat because I can't actually, I don't actually measure the shear modulus um, in my experiments. I can measure the bulk modulus with with these particular experiments, and so these shear moduli are just based on the um, the data that is in the Birdman um, code. So. Take these with a large grains of salt, but you do see that there is quite a difference. And this is particular uh, because the phase assemblages are so different. Okay. In a separate set of experiments, we have also tried to melt um, these, uh, these samples. And I just show, I just show two samples. Um, the, on the left-hand side, again, is the reduced sample compared to the right-hand side is the oxidized sample. And what we've found is that, and not surprisingly, is that the reduced samples, that is the multi-phase assemblage, assemblage melts um, at lower, has a solidus temperature uh, that is several hundred degrees cooler than that of the oxidized sample. Okay. So what are the implications for all of this? Okay, so just taking that last sort of screenshot of our, of our convection uh, simulation, you know, that means that you know, we could have an oxidized upper mantle Great. That seems that seems to be the going suggestion. Um, this oxidized upper mantle could then buffer um, any uh, atmospheres that are forming um, currently, as well as uh, early on. Um, at the bottom, we could have reduced dense, maybe primordial piles along the core mantle boundary. These reduced piles would also have lower velocities. Okay, 10% in VP, 30% in VS. So perhaps if we look at a tomographic model, perhaps these red and blue patches are suggesting that the slower regions could just be more reduced and the faster regions could be more oxidizing. So in summary, you know, what are the effects of redox on mantle mineralogy and possibly the evolution of the planet? Reduced samples uh, have more complex mineralogy and greater assemblage density as well as lower solidus temperatures. Oxidized samples, um, on the other hand, um, could also form solid solution between the magnesium and calcium perovskite, thereby allowing the Bridgmanite phase uh, to be a vehicle for large uh, uh, cation lithophiles, perhaps heat-producing ones that we're so interested in. Okay. So heterogeneities observed in the mantle may not just be due to changes um, in bulk chemistry or temperature, but also um, due to redox. Thank you. All right, we have to move on.
Okay, I've been uh, tasked with uh, attempting to relate uh, deep earth structures that are seismically identified with uh, our current geochemical database. I'm going to start off briefly with a, a review of what we know from long-lived radiogenic isotope systems. The, uh, the red and yellow figure is a kind of overview of uh, strontium, neodymium, and lead isotopic variations that uh, pop out of the mantle in the form of ocean island basalts and mid-ocean ridge basalts. It's a figure, I think, that was created to make isotopes easy for the geophysics community. Um, <laughs> Bottom line is that uh, most of the variations that we see in a figure like this are a result of uh, melting in the upper mantle and uh, recycling lithospheric materials back into the mantle. And so it's a function of changing parent-daughter uh, ratios during uh, the past three to four million years. The problem with this uh, tying geochemical signatures like this to deep earth uh, features is that uh, most of what we see here is uh, driven by processes moving materials from the upper part of the silicate earth into the lower part of the silicate earth. So it's not so easy tying these observations to uh, geophysically observed features. And so there are a number of uh, models in the literature. Here I just showed two. The one on the left is for uh, possible storage of primitive uh, mantle material, and the figure on the right is from long ago showing recycling of uh, lithospheric materials. So the question that I want to address with the rest of my time here is, can seismically observed deep earth structures uh, be linked with short-lived radiogenic isotope systems, and I'll also throw helium-3-4 ratios into the mix. So I'm going to be combining neodymium-142, tungsten-182, and helium isotopic data for modern ocean island basalts, and uh, we're going to consider the isotopic variations that we see within the framework of what is known about uh, large low shear velocity provinces, LLSVPs, and ultra low velocity zones. So that's where we're headed, those two uh, features that have been discussed quite a bit at this meeting. So the two relevant uh, short-lived systems that I'll be talking about here are the decay of samarium-146 to neodymium-142. Uh, this is a system that has a half-life of about 100 million years and the uh, system hafnium-182 decaying to tungsten-182 with a half-life of about 9 million years. In the case of samarium neodymium, these are two elements that are cited essentially exclusively in the silicate earth. In the case of hafnium tungsten, hafnium is a lithophile element, so all of it is in the silicate earth, but about 90 percent of tungsten is sitting in the core. It's a moderately siderophile element. The samarium neodymium system was live for the first half billion years of solar system history. The hafnium tungsten system was live during only about the first 50 million years of solar system history. Uh, just to set the stage, I'm going to be using mu notation. Mu means part per million deviation from isotopic standards. The standards that we use, we generally assume to be uh, uh, representative of bulk silicate earth, although on the fine scale that may not be true. So mu values that are not zero we will assume are anomalous if they plot outside of their analytical uncertainties. Another important point is the third one here. In the silicate earth, hafnium is fractionated from tungsten and samarium is fractionated from neodymium in roughly similar manners. And so if there's an early silicate fractionation event recorded by these two isotope systems, they should be positively correlated, meaning you would have positive anomalies in both systems or negative anomalies in both systems. Finally, because the core formed early in Earth history and based on an assumption that the Earth has a chondritic tungsten isotopic composition, and mass balance, we assume that the core has a very different tungsten isotopic composition from you and me, more than 200 parts per million lower than uh, us here. Uh, helium-3-4 has been talked about quite a bit in this uh, meeting so far. This is a really brief uh, sketch of what uh, we know about helium. So both helium-3 and 4 are, of course, primordial isotopes, but helium-4 is also produced in uh, the earth by decay of uranium-238 and uh, 
uranium-235 and thorium-232. So high helium-3-4 ratios that are commonly observed in ocean island basalt systems, or at least some ocean island basalt systems, uh, are usually in the literature associated with primitive mantle that is undegassed and not particularly enriched in incompatible trace elements like uranium and thorium. One other thing we have to consider, going back to that first slide I showed you, is the effects of uh, recycling of materials, lithospheric materials, into uh, what may be primordial reservoirs. The addition of recycled materials uh, may attenuate the signatures that we see with regard to tungsten, neodymium, and helium. Just to make a long story short, helium is probably least affected by recycling processes, uh, tungsten somewhere in between and neodymium is most likely to be affected by uh, recycling processes. So just as a quick overview, uh, this is a collection of neodymium-142 data versus time. You can see that there's a lot of 142 variation in early earth rocks going from left to right in this slide, and there's not so much variation in modern rocks. You also notice there's a huge gap where there's essentially no data. Uh, rotating that type of uh, figure a bit here, uh, these are uh, 182 tungsten data for early earth rocks. I just am showing you this to convince you that there are isotopic heterogeneities in tungsten space in early earth rocks. The vertical scale is not time, so this is just a bunch of data to show you that most early earth rocks, strangely enough, have positive tungsten anomalies. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time talking about that. What's more uh, germane for this talk are data for modern ocean island basalts. So again, this is a plot of MU-182 down here. Uh, I give up with the arrow. On the uh, horizontal scale, and it just shows data for a bunch of uh, different ocean island basalt systems. Also shows uh, a, a few data for MORB, which are uh, normal. The ocean island basalt data by and large range from normal to uh, significantly negative anomalies. First question to ask, do we see a correlation between neodymium-142 and 182? The data are very limited at uh, present. We would expect a positively sloped correlation for any of the three systems shown here, Galapagos, Hawaii, and Samoa. If you separate the colors, you certainly don't see a correlation within either of the uh, three ocean island basalt systems. If anything, if you put all these together, you see maybe a slight negative correlation, which I won't talk about. Um, this is kind of the uh, payoff slide of this talk. This is a plot of mu-182 tungsten on the vertical scale versus helium-3-4 ratio. We've been publishing data like this for the last three years for individual ocean island basalt systems. There are these uh, what appear to be uh, linear correlations between helium and tungsten with higher helium-3-4 ratios corresponding with lower mu-182 tungsten ratios. So you get these different trends for different ocean island basalt systems, and in fact, Iceland even shows two trends. Uh, from a mixing standpoint, these trends and the collection of all the data together require at least uh, three isotopically distinct mantle source regions. So this is the same uh, figure that you just looked at now with uh, three components that we envision contributing to these isotopic compositions, uh, one, two, and three, uh, which I'll show you in the next slide, component three is well below the scale of this figure. Most of what we're seeing in this simplified mixing diagram is mixing between components one and two. So component one has normal everything, component two has high helium three, four, but normal uh, tungsten 182, and component 3 is the one with the very low mu 182, as I will show you. The takeaway point of this slide, though, is given the concentrations of tungsten and helium that we envision for these end member components, it doesn't take much of 3 to uh, put a significant negative tungsten signature into an ocean island basalt source. So this is the full expression of uh, the three-way mixing that we see here. I don't have time to discuss where the numbers on the left-hand side of the figure come from. Uh, the most important takeaway point is in that yellow box. 
Uh, we envision component three as being mantle that has isotopically and chemically equilibrated with the core. This could happen either as a consequence of uh, molten silicate or even solid state diffusion. Uh, the interesting thing about it is because tungsten loses some of its uh, siderophilic nature at high pressures and temperatures, uh, any silicate equilibration between core and mantle actually puts a fair amount of tungsten back into that mantle reservoir. So down here, okay, I still can't show it. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see uh, the tungsten concentration that we envision for this domain to be over 300 parts per billion, which for us is pretty high. It also has a tungsten isotopic composition that we envision for the core. Okay, so what are these components? Uh, component one from our standpoint, from a neodymium-142, tungsten-182, helium-3-4 ratio is really boring. It's all of the mantle that shows no variation in those. It could be all sorts of wildly complex mantle, but uh, from the standpoint of these primordial systems, not so much. Uh, so we just call this ambient mantle. You can fit uh, all of your favorite uh, long-lived radiogenic isotope systems into this component if you wish. Component two has to be um, globally common with uh, regard to ocean island basalts. Again, there have been a few talks already this uh, meeting discussing the coincidence of high helium-3-4 sources with the boundaries of uh, LLSVPs. Uh, this component, uh, at least from our standpoint, has normal neodymium-142 and normal tungsten-182. And so uh, our best guess is that, yes, component two in this case are LLSVPs, which uh, probably most of you in this room uh, probably already know, comprise maybe about 8% of the mantle. Uh, LLSVPs likely contain variable proportions of uh, recycled materials. And as I said, uh, they're spatially associated with uh, many of the ocean island basalt systems that show high helium-3-4. Component three, from our standpoint, is the most interesting. Uh, it has normal neodymium-142, probably, uh, and uh, significantly depleted tungsten-182, and is also characterized by high helium-3-4, we think. It's a minor component of the OIB signature, if you believe our mixing calculations, so it doesn't have to be volumetrically significant, but it does have to be globally available for ocean island basalts, as every OIB system that has supra morb helium-3-4 so far has negative tungsten anomalies as well. So we posit that uh, we're probably getting this signature from ultra-low velocity zones. Most of you are probably familiar with this figure. Uh, Ultra-low velocity zones are small features in terms of volume. Uh, they are probable locations for core mantle equilibration to occur. We know uh, mega ultra-low velocity zones are associated with Hawaii, Samoa, and Iceland. And yesterday we heard that uh, the Galapagos hotspot is also associated with a mega ultra-low velocity zone. All three of those systems show uh, superb helium tungsten trends. And so if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it might be a duck. So I'm just gonna end then with this uh, conceptual model for the origin of uh, tungsten helium anomalies. Again, one we're calling ambient mantle, two LLSVPs, and component three ultra low velocity zones. Thank you. So maybe we have time for a short question. Right. Yes. Not. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Um, if you um, 
are, are, are ready to leave for lunch, I can give you the quick conclusion of this talk. Um, ocean crust recycling, ocean crust formation and recycling is important for forming geochemical and geophysical uh, structure inside the Earth's mantle. Uh, and what I'll primarily be showing is some new tests that uh, we've been able to do uh, with new techniques. Uh, this work uh, over the years has uh, involved a large number of characters uh, and has been generally supported uh, or gener generously supported by the CSETI uh, program of the National Science Foundation. Um, these two diagrams we just saw in the previous talk, uh, ocean crust has been alluded to in the formation of various end members, uh, most particular DMM as part of the formation of ocean crust. Uh, high mu as for recycling and EM1 also has been implicated in that. The uh, question is whether these, uh, these little worms that Stan Hart drew uh, are, are, are really mixing between uh, separate reservoirs inside the Earth's mantle or whether there are processes uh, that lead to these. And I think that, that we're starting to lean towards processes. A uh, figure from a uh, paper by uh, Hoffman and White, uh, first published in the Carnegie uh, yearbook, um, showing uh, a new idea at the time uh, that this ocean crust recycling was an important complement uh, to just the formation of ocean crust out of the upper mantle. And I think the diagram on the right is uh, intended to make geodynamics easy for geochemists. Rich, you're not even smiling. Um, so uh, early geodynamic model that confirmed this idea of ocean crust recycling was by Hoffman and Christensen. Uh, it was a relatively simplified Cartesian box, low convective vigor, uh, but the ability to form ocean crust, recycle it, uh, dense ocean crust uh, remained at the uh, core metal boundary, but then recycled back in. Uh, by scaling up uh, this, by uh, using Rayleigh number arguments, uh, they argued that they could reproduce uh, the lead-lead isotope trends and importantly the two a billion year residence time of material. Uh, in a uh, paper about 10 years ago, we uh, confirmed that this works if you scale up these models geodynamically. Um, a paper by J.P. Brandenburg uh, put this in uh, more of a spherical context. Actually, this is a cylindrical model where you see that the core has been shrunk compared to uh, the real Earth. Uh, this is so that heat transfer properties are similar to that of the spherical Earth. Uh, due to the, uh, we have a form of plate tectonics on top that's uh, energetically consistent. And due to the formation of ocean crust in a higher viscosity lower mantle, uh, we see the development of a lot of heterogeneity in the lower mantle, uh, but uh, uh, a well mixed upper mantle, in large part due to the lower viscosity as well as the strong shearing motion of the plates. Uh, we do develop uh, similar structures to what Christensen and Hoffman showed. Uh, and we see uh, fluid dynamical properties at uh, the base thinking, uh, suggesting that we have enough uh, resolution. And this, of course, leads to the folding uh, of uh, oceanic crust or ocean crust derived material uh, shown in white and Hartsbergitic components shown in black uh, that looks like the typical marble cake mantle. Um, we have uh, done significant work to uh, modernize this approach uh, using the spherical annulus, uh, using a yield stress rheology that uh, Paul Tackley uh, introduced uh, quite a while ago. Uh, the spherical, the, uh, we do use a, a rather new method, at least for the earth sciences, uh, which is called Phoenix. It's a method where you, instead of building your own matrix in Fortran or C++, uh, you actually formulate the differential equations, initial conditions, and then the finite element code is built for you, allowing for a much more robust way of, of building codes that are consistent and using the most uh, modern and, and efficient uh, processes. In this particular case, uh, the animation showed uh, the formation of oceanic crust in the interaction with uh, a pre-existing uh, primordial structure, uh, very similar to the work that uh, Ming Ming Li and Alan McNamara uh, published about a half a decade ago. Um, we weren't able to uh, get these models uh, ready for full interpretation during this AGU presentation, so I'm going to be using the older Brandenburg models as the framework. Uh, clearly, the denser we expect that ecclogite density to be, uh, the more we find pooling uh, and we find structures that are reminiscent of the LLSVPs. It's important to note that the morph density uh, or the, the basaltic density here uh, is uh, that with respect to ambient mantle, uh, the structures that form at the core metal boundary have density excess that are only a couple of percent uh, in excess of that mantle because it's a mixture of Hartsbergite and basalt as well as that it's uh, warm. Um, here's an important diagram, I think. We, we have these models that we can interrogate using what plate velocities they predict as well as what heat flow comes out of them. 
these are observables and uh, we do not seem to publish this as frequently as we probably should in the geodynamical literature uh, to demonstrate what the convective vigor of the system is. Um, the plate velocities and heat flow are similar to that of the present day Earth, where plate velocities are similar to the toroidal component of about three centimeters per year, a slight reduction uh, as the ecologet density goes up. Another important thing we reproduce uh, geochemically in these uh, features is that about 50% of argon that has been produced over the age of the Earth is now in the Earth's atmosphere, which is a fundamental geochemical constraint. Uh, we can query these models as well using various lithophile isotope systems. Uh, this, uh, for anybody but the geochemist, you can probably just interpret this as a version of this versus that plots. Uh, the triangles uh, in the background are essentially from the PetDB database. Uh, the dots are our model predictions. Uh, and it suggested that independent isotope systems uh, can be met reasonably well. Uh, they're not perfect, but that we're constrained by the geodynamics. Uh, but uh, uh, we do get a reproduction, particularly of DMM, uh, high mu, and, and EM1 in these models. Uh, most recent update to this is the use of the lithium hafnian system. Uh, where we showed that uh, the previously suggested importance of continental crust recycling, and not just a little bit, but actually relatively large amounts, is important uh, in explaining uh, the isotope characteristics. Uh, these models are not far from perfect. Uh, one important uh, self-criticism is that even although we, we produce the spread of uh, the isotopes reasonably well, it turns out that the uh, upper mantle is more enriched than the lower mantle, uh, contrary to, to what we expect. Uh, this likely has to do with the fact that these models are too much of a whole convection uh, nature. Uh, we recycle the oceanic crust and the residue or the harsh bajitic crust immediately to the lower mantle. Uh, this is not necessarily consistent with what we see from tomography, uh, what we see from high resolution slab images. And so Jonathan Tucker uh, made a nice box model analysis that he presented yesterday in a poster uh, where this, this inversion that is shown in the circle uh, with a two depleted uh, 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 two depleted lower mantle and two enriched upper mantle can be, can I go back? Oh, oh is this one? Thank you. Um, can be fixed if we reduce the, the leakage of the slabs into the lower mantle and have recycling of up to about 45% of slabs that stay in the upper mantle, uh, which might be consistent with various flat slab observations. Um, one aspect that we haven't quantified yet, but is I think obvious from these diagrams is that we do uh, gain very sharp sights to these structures, uh, similar to what work by Jeroen Ritzma and Ni and others at, uh, at Caltech have, have suggested uh, from early array studies. Uh, this is an uh, important constraint. Uh, we're trying to find if we, uh, we have time and, and, and money enough to, to figure out if we can uh, do this more quantitatively. A couple of quantitative tests that we have from seismology include uh, that these models with dense oceanic crust uh, satisfy at present day observations from scattering, uh, characteristics of the tomographic model S40 RTS, uh, as well as spectral characteristics of that particular model. Um, at the bottom is the scattering uh, paper uh, produced by Sam Hawkland, uh, uh, recent PhD at the Uni University of Michigan, um, where if there's any scattering material uh, in uh, the lower mantle, uh, you expect that uh, this will lead to precursors uh, coming ahead of the, PK, the main PK-IKP phase in a very specific part of the epicentral uh, distance uh, spectrum. And it turns out that if we have a model that has a relatively large uh, density excess of this oceanic crust, we actually reproduce quite nicely uh, these characteristics. Uh, the wiggles uh, and the envelopes are from full waveform simulations that we made using uh, a three-dimensional approximation to uh, these, uh, uh, the, 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 the expected velocity contrast and the scattering effect. Here's work by uh, Tim Jones and Ross McGuire in particular, uh, where they looked at how these models would show up in tomography. Uh, the way that this is done is to take the uh, dynamical models and translate the temperature and composition to seismic velocities, in this case, S-wave velocity. Uh, we then reparameterize these high resolution models to the lower resolution that's in the tomographic models. Uh, and then we filter that using the uh, resolution filter that's available in the S40 RTS model. And so what we see is we have a sequence of high resolution VS uh, that on, on the, in, in the lower uh, middle part uh, that then gets fuzzy uh, due to the uh, tomographic damping effects. 
Uh, but at first blush, we do regain structures that both suggest that there are slab-like components uh, in the lower mantle, uh, as well as these, these LLSVPs with similar type of magnitudes and spread uh, uh, for, uh, compared to what's here shown below uh, the Central Pacific or South Central Pacific. Uh, we do need relatively high uh, excess densities. Uh, need to start at about three. In this particular case, we see that if we have no aclogite excess density, so no pooling of material, we do not reproduce these LLSVPs at all. So a thermal origin of the LLSVPs might be difficult to, to make. Uh, by the time we get above about 3%, we get very robust LLSVP-style structures uh, that are made. I don't suggest that this means that all oceanic, that, that these LLSVPs are purely oceanic crust. It just suggests that they can be made of oceanic crust, uh, but it's likely is some form of primordial component in there, as is evidenced from a lot of geochemistry. Uh, and so there probably is some sort of mixture between these two. Uh, it will be interesting to try to find a quantification between the relative importance between the primordial components and the ocean crust recycling. Uh, finally, the spectral characteristics uh, of S40 RTS. Uh, are much better uh, satisfied with the models with high ecclogite density. Uh, the high amplitude here shows where there's a lot of signal at a particular wave number, uh, the normalized with respect to the maximum of that to make, make them all look similar. Uh, clearly, there's a lot more energy at high frequency uh, if we do not have these ecclogite uh, pools, uh, whereas if we do have the ecclogite pools, we see that everything conforms more to a degree two uh, type structure as is seen in s 40 r as well. So I think that, that we have a number of strong geochemical and geophysical indicators uh, why the LLSVPs can be made uh, of oceanic crust and ocean crust recycling only. It doesn't have to be, but it can be, uh, as well as that the ocean crust is responsible uh, for, or ocean crust formation is responsible for part of the spectrum of the geochemical observations that we see. So with that, uh, I've brought us back to schedule. Thank you. Good. So now we have time for questions. No, we need to move on. <laughs> Nobody? All right, thank you. Okay. The title of the talk is uh, Mantle Heterogeneity in Terrestrial Planets, Formation, Preservation, and uh, Mixing. And I would like to thank uh, the conveners and my co-authors. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll just show this in, on the first slide to um, just as an example to show how important it is to consider planetary differentiation. Um, so the very early days of uh, Earth to understand the long-term uh, planetary evolution. Uh, so in the example of a magma ocean and the basal magma ocean that crystallizes, we might still see the, the remnants um, uh, of that uh, in, in the present day. So this is an example of how, how we have to consider the initial condition of mantle convection for the long-term evolution. For the purpose of this talk, I will mostly assume the, an Earth centric view, but we'll also talk a little bit about Mars in the end of this talk. Um, of course, we would like to test any model for long-term uh, planetary evolution with uh, geophysical and geochemical constraints. So for the Earth, we have, um, well, we have talked about these LLSVPs, which might be thermochemical piles at the base of the mantle. Uh, but we also have good evidence for slabs that go down all the way to the base of the mantle plumes that uh, also in recent tomography models that uh, cross the entire mantle. So we have very good evidence for whole mantle convection and mixing. So in the first order, or zeros order, I should say, the mantle is, is homogeneous on long, uh, uh, on long large uh, length scales. So the mantle is basically gray um, with some shadings uh, as um, indicated here, also in this cartoon. Um, and and there is there's nothing like a like a deep dense layer or something uh in in the, at the base of the mantle uh so uh, the story starts uh well with co-formation and with um magma oceans uh 
make motions are stabilized due to the energy release of core formation and um, giant impacts. There are several giant impacts, presumably several episodes of magma oceans and ma um, giant impacts release a lot of heat to sustain global and deep magma oceans. The magma ocean is expected to freeze, um, well, to the zeroth order again from the bottom uh, to the top. And while it freezes, it should fractionate. Iron is less compatible than magnesium and should be enriched in the magma ocean. And eventually the coexisting cumulates should be also iron enriched. And if you do this kind of um, exercise, then what you expect is a density or iron profile uh, that looks like this, so it's almost um, exponential and strongly uh, iron enriched at the top, which would provoke a gravitational overturn and lead to a post overturn profile that looks like this with density anomalies of about, yeah, up to a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So these are huge density anomalies. So you would expect that the present day mantle looks like this. These kind of density anomalies uh, can never be uh, erased by mantle convection and entrainment. Uh, so you would expect a global deep dense layer, but this is not what we see by seismic tomography. So this is kind of the problem statement. This is not what we see in this uh, cartoon, um, which we're of course very convinced of. So one uh, way to uh, reconcile this is to account for cumulative convection or protomantle convection while the magma ocean is still crystallizing. So if you do this, then you might mix the mantle while uh, the magma ocean is still there. And maybe this is sufficient to explain why the mantle to first order um, looks, looks fairly homogeneous and we have whole mantle convection. But if you, if you run these kind of models, and now here the color scale is kind of flipped, so the colors are the solid and the gray is the magma ocean that shrinks. The, there are incremental overturns and the final incremental overturn is still stabilizing a deep dense layer, a very iron edge layer here um, in the blue colors. Uh, you can consider different kind of scenarios, but you will always end up with a layer that is um, tens of kilometers thick at the base of the mantle and that should survive for billions of years uh, for the age of the earth at the base of the mantle. So this is, again is inconsistent with the constraints that we have from geophysics. Uh, so just to summarize this briefly, in the, in the top scenario, um, ah, sorry here, in the top scenario where you have this single overturn, you get a thick uh, deep dense layer. If you consider incremental overturns, cumulative convection during magma ocean uh, freezing, you get a thinner deep dense layer, but it's still deep and uh, uh, still very dense and global and inconsistent with the observations. Now, how do we solve this? Um, there's a third scenario here. If we consider uh, partial melting during uh, cumulative convection, during mantle convection, uh, in the presence of the magma ocean, we would expect that if we have these incremental downwellings, these sinking diapirs, there would be uh, upwelling of super adiabatic, super adiabatic material, very hot material. The, the protomantle is super adiabatic because, yeah, it's, it has been, um, yeah, freezing close to the solidus or somewhere between the solidus and the liquidus. And the melts are basically um, buffering the composition of the magma ocean by, by dilution, um, if you want, uh, so, so that the composition of these melts should be something like a basalt or a comediate. And so the, uh, the composition of the final stage magma ocean, instead of becoming very, very iron enriched due to distillation, uh, should be buffered towards these upper mantle melting products or partial melting products. So in this case, instead of getting these very uh, iron enriched um, cumulates at the very end, you get moderately iron enriched cumulates at the very end you get these incremental, you, you expect to get these incremental overturns and a less iron-enriched uh, bezel layer should form that might potentially be swept up to form piles and everybody's happy. Um, okay, but this still doesn't consider the basal magma ocean. So once uh, you, you form this deep uh, dense layer, iron-enriched layers, even though it's still, it's only moderately iron-enriched, you expect uh, after thermal equilibration that this uh, layer will thermally, will, will melt to form a basal magma ocean. And maybe you already have a basal magma ocean from the very start, um, or several basal magma oceans due to several uh, giant impacts. 
So we also have to consider the fractional crystallization of the bezel mag motion. So this is the same thing as we've seen before, but just upside down. We get enrichment of iron in the bezel mag motion as bridgmanite and periclase eventually are um, precipitated uh, due to fractional crystallization. And again, you get a very dense, so this is the same thing in a different color scale. You get a very dense, uh, deep dense layer and you really should expect fractional crystallization in the basal magma ocean because the basal magma ocean cools very slowly. It's limited by, by um, mental convection that takes out the heat out of the basal magma ocean. So you should really expect to get this deep dense layer and now if you wait for 4.5 billion years, you will not be able to entrain that layer. It, it is, uh, again, uh, several hundreds of uh, kilograms per cubic meter denser than the ambient mantle, and you would expect a layer that is tens of kilometers thick to persist at the base of the mantle, and you would, you would see that seismically, but we, we don't see that. Uh, so there's, there's still a problem. There's a discrepancy between, or maybe a basal magma motion never existed, but uh, there's a discrepancy between this, this model of a basal magma motion fractional crystallization um, and the present day structure of the Earth. Uh, so day before yesterday, I presented a poster uh, to uh, reconcile uh, this uh, problem, um, and I considered reactive freezing of the basal magma motion. So if you do have this overturn of a primary crust that is basically basaltic slash chromatitic in, in uh, composition, then the basal magma motion in this ternary diagram would be at this uh, silica-rich, uh, well, not end member, but it's uh, silica-rich compared to the mantle, which sits over here, so this is pyrolite. Um, and the basal magma motion would be in uh, chemical disequilibrium with the mantle. So you expect, instead of a fractional crystallization due to cooling, that the basal magma motion should freeze by reaction uh, with uh, the mantle. So you form these reactive cumulates, which in the beginning are MGSiO3, and these get swept up by mantle convection, and um, the residual liquids get mixed into the basal magma motion, and the basal magma motion actually evolves in, in this direction over time. So for details, just ask me or visit the poster uh, day before yesterday. <laughs> um, and and uh, eventually, once the basal magma motion gets close to the uh, cotectic uh, valley, um, you're not anymore in the liquid plus bridgmanite stability field, but you enter actually the um, bridgmanite plus ferropericlase stability field. So now your reactive cumulates will be actually here, and this is actually a very sharp transition. Uh, it's not exactly clear where it is. It depends a little bit on the initial condition of the initial composition of the basal magma motion, but somewhere there it will be 70% um, yeah, bridgmanite and 30% ferropericlase and moderately iron enriched. So instead of getting this kind of um, cumulate uh, sequence, which gets progressively iron-rich at the bottom and very, very iron-rich, uh, basically these, these eutectic uh, composition at the very bottom, we get this um, uh, double uh, cumulate sequence, first these MGSO3 cumulates over here, and then transitioning uh, suddenly into these moderately iron-enriched um, Bridgmanite plus ferric periclase cumulates. So, uh, what would happen to such a cumulate sequence? So this is, uh, of course, yeah, at the bottom of the mantle, so you have pyrolite on top of this. Um, what would happen to such a cumulate sequence um, over time? So let's just consider first the moderately iron-rich uh, cumulates. Let's change the color scale to confuse you and run a numerical model for 4.5 billion years and, and a moderately iron-rich material with a density anomaly of about 200 kilograms per cubic meter, uh, such as predicted by this um, freezing model or reactive freezing model, can be swept up into, into LLSVP-like piles. So maybe this can uh, account for the, for the LLSVP-like piles. And let's uh, look at the fate of these uh, um, MGSIO3 cumulates, which are formed in the beginning due to reaction freezing. Again, let's uh, change the color scale uh, to confuse you. and. Um, so now we are running uh, these models with a uh, bridgmanitic uh, layer at the base of the mantle and pyrolytic uh, layer in the, in the upper mantle. And the bridgmanite is intrinsically strong, uh, so it wouldn't be mixed very efficiently by mantle convection. Instead, mantle convection or whole mantle convection is accommodated 
uh, in the upwelling and downwelling conduits around these uh, bridge um, uh, domains, or also called bridge enriched ancient mental structures, as have been uh, noted earlier in this session, or the acronym is BEAMS. Um, and to compare the prediction of these models with seismic observations, we haven't really done this yet, but here we are plotting uh, on the left hand side, so composition is on, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, uh, it's temperature and or potential temperature, and it's uh, showing that these might not be very visible in seismic tomography, particularly if you consider that there's also a trade off between composition and temperature in terms of seismic velocities. Let's just um, check this uh, regime diagram. So, uh, of course, we varied, we, we explored many uh, simulations, as we've just seen. Um, we varied the viscosity contrast of the bridge magnetic material with the rest of the mantle and also the density contrast um, in the vertical axis. Um, and for high viscosity contrast, you get this beams like uh, regime. For lower viscosity contrast, you get smaller blobs. For no viscosity contrast and no density contrast, uh, you get very efficient mixing um, between the two layers. For higher density contrast, you get double layered uh, convection with and without topography. You can also get piles. So this has been also um, demonstrated in other works. And there's another interesting regime which might be relevant for the Earth in, uh, for intermediate buoyancy numbers, so intermediate density contrasts, where first you start with, uh, for a couple of billions year, of years, you start with double layered convection, then you entrain some part of the lower layer into the upper layer, and eventually the double layered convection breaks down, and there's not sufficient time to mix uh, the primordial material, which would uh, still be preserved after 4.5 billion years in streaks or diffuse uh, domains. Um, yeah, let's just uh, test this model. I'll, I'll go back to this, this BEAMS model, which is in one corner of the parameter space. Um, this might be able to explain uh, plume deflection due to flow around the beams, uh, slab stagnation on, on top of these intrinsically viscous beams. So it might be a good place to put a chondritic reservoir, so to, to balance the MGSI ratio of, of the earth com or the bulk silicate earth compared to chondrites and um, also uh, yeah, um, sustain a viscosity hill in the mid-mantle. And if you like ancient geochemical reservoirs, as we've heard two talks ago, then the beams and the LLSVPs are maybe a good place uh, to put them, um, at least this kind of reservoir number, number two, or maybe uh, not yet uh, resolved reservoir number four. Um, just to briefly mention the difference between Earth and Mars. So for Earth, as I mentioned, magma ocean, partial melting, overturn, incremental overturn, basal magma ocean, fractional crystallization of the basal magma ocean that may uh, um, form two different cumulates that, uh, that are good candidates to explain LLSVPs and beams. Whereas for Mars, we are not sure if we, if we can actually form a basal magma ocean and so we're not sure if we will have uh, beams-like features in, in Mars or if the LLSVPs are a deep, dense layer or piles. So this is still to be seen by the InSight mission. Uh, well, there's, a, uh, I guess, a session running in parallel to this uh, session. Um, so the conclusion is uh, ancient heterogeneity formed by basal magma ocean uh, crystallization can be preserved um, even in the presence of mantle convection. Thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thank you for staying late. Uh, we are uh, running out the session, and uh, so thank you very much for coming.